Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And there's a hell of a lot going on in the markets, guys. So I thought I'd put out uh, another video on a really key instrument, uh, probably arguably the key instrument of global macro finance, talking of course about the US dollar. Today, we're going to talk about how that affects all asset prices, including what we're interested in, in terms of the assets on eToro. If you're not familiar with the channel, I am a popular investor on eToro. And if you uh, get a chance to like and subscribe the video, I'd greatly appreciate that. Moving forwards, we'll get straight into it today. So if you think about what is price, it's kind of like a market bid or a quote, and people get the difference between price and value uh, mixed up all the time. So if you jump onto your lo your brokerage and you see the lights flickering away and, and numbers changing, that's the, the current real-time uh, high-speed changes in bids and asks, okay? So what a buyer is bidding for a given asset and what a seller is asking for a given asset. And we, we kind of get that, that's easy. What we don't always get is um, what instruments are we quoting when we're, we're doing that? So if we're quoting in dollars, I'm saying I want to buy a stock for a dollar fifty, let's say, what does that really mean? And what happens when that measuring stick starts to change. So if I were to measure a meter, I can do a lot of things, build houses, give instructions, build blueprints and plans. But what happens if the length of a meter keeps changing all the time? That's really something to think about. And that's the value of a dollar. We're measuring things in dollars mainly. The value of a dollar, if it's changing, can wreak havoc when you're trying to figure out where your, your real returns are going to be for investment purposes. So the three main things that really run the world in terms of pricing instruments. And that is the US 10 year treasury note, okay, the bond that the US government to its citizens uh, for 10 years, you lend the, the, you buy a bond, you lend the government money for 10 years, they give you that money back at the end of 10 years. And along the way, they pay you a certain rate of interest. Okay, here we've got the barrel of a WTI, so West Texas Intermediate, so a barrel of oil, and the US dollar itself. So you've got the US dollar that you bid, for example, on uh, a physical good or asset, so a barrel of oil. And then you've got the 10 year treasury note, which is a debt instrument that pays you back in physical dollars so that you can buy goods and services, okay, such as oil, which we need. And that treasury notes interest is what sets the interest rate markets for the rest of this, uh, the global economy, for example, the mortgage rate that you pay on your house, uh, the car loan that you might have a business loan, whatever the case may be. Okay, so very, very important, because changes to the nature of these pricing units, this is what we're using to price everything else that we buy in the real economy. The 10 year yield. So this is very important. On April 21st this year, uh, my birthday, Fed Chair Jerome Powell did not give me a very nice present, indicated that interest rate hike of 50 basis points is on the table for the, the May meeting. Now I must admit, this caught me slightly off guard. I did think that they uh, would begin to raise interest rates. I didn't think they would go uh, quite so hard quite so soon. He also stated that an additional uh, hike of 50 basis points is favored by several uh, federal o open market committee uh, members. It is absolutely essential to get price stability power set. So he's really throwing down the gauntlet saying he wants to tame inflation. We've seen huge run ups in inflation for consumer goods and, and services. And so obviously, if you allow interest rates to rise, the amount of money that you earn the proportion that has to go towards servicing those debts because you now have a high interest rate uh, to, of which you need to repay, you've got less money less left over for spending on other items, okay? Less discretionary spending. That really decreases the demand pool for goods and it slows down the demand side of inflation. What this does not do is create any uh, extra goods or services in the economy. So this does not put any more barrels of oil on the market. It doesn't free up any more uh, cubic feet of natural gas. It doesn't dig up any more gold or, or any type of uh, metal from the ground that we use for industry. It doesn't uh, grow any corn and put it on the global corn market. You get the idea. So this is, this is purely on the demand side of the equation designed to slow down the demand because that's all they can do. They, they can't impact supply really uh, at all. Economic levers. So 
you need to understand when the Fed stops QE, which they have, and that is what they were using to buy up bonds, okay, the 10-year notes. When you have a heap of money being, uh, for want of a better word, printed, those notes, okay, that, that M2 is used to buy the bonds, okay? That drives down the interest rate yield because it drives up the price of the bond and the yield is the inverse of that, obviously. And so the, the yield as a percentage goes down. Why do they do that? Well, so that the interest rates start to drop and we, during hard times, it, the idea is that it stokes more demand for goods and services. If you've got lower interest rates, you might go and buy a house, a, ha a car or, or any other consumer good because you have less money you have to worry about servicing your interest. The bids for the 10 year dry up. Okay. So now once that goes away and they stop have this, having this artificial buying pressure underneath the bond price, the bond price starts to fall. And so what do you think happens to the yield? The yield starts to inversely correlate and rise. So if you've got no one else, uh, for want of a bit of a term, artificially bidding up the price of the 10 year, the price drops to entice more buyers. Okay. If, <laughs> if it's only the fed buying because it's, you know, been pushed to crazy prices. If you've got something that no one wants for a hundred dollars, you've got to try and sell it at $90. And if no one wants it at $90, you've got to keep dropping to 80 and 70 and 60 and so on and so forth until suddenly buyers start to come in again and push up the, the price. Price is the inverse of yield, which we've said. So as the price drops, the yield is rising. So anytime you see the yield rising on a bond, you think to yourself that the inverse of that is that the price of the bond is falling. Okay. And when you see the, uh, the yield of a, a bond increase, particularly in this case, a sovereign bond, you start to think to yourself that in that local economy, and in this case, the global economy, because the US is so instrumental in the global economy, that's going to increase the interest rates in other parts of the economy, uh, both internally to the US and externally. Bond yields rising and the Fed uh, credit tightens. Okay, so increasing upward pressure on commercial and consumer debt. That's what I just described before. When your bond yields are rising, uh, say on the 10 year, if the 10 years at 3% yield, the mortgage rate will be traditionally around the six to even 7% yield. Okay. So your, your average person going out, getting a mortgage, all of a sudden has gone from having to pay 3% uh, two years ago or less than that. Uh, I was looking at some, uh, some rates in Italy uh, and for European citizens, you can get access to, or you could have gotten access to credit at a fixed rate at 1.89%. I was quoted over a 30 year period, which is just, I mean, just insane. It's fixed for the entire period. Whereas in Australia, it's all a, a house of cards. And so you can only fix things in for, for five or even seven years, I think would be the, the max. So bond yields rise, you, your mortgage, let's use the mortgage because it's most important starts to rise, um, uh, in accordance with that. And so your proportion of income that you use to service that mortgage goes up. And so you've got less left over to spend in the economy. And so we start to go into slowing growth, disinflation, uh, potentially de uh, recession. If it's really bad, it could be a, a, a depression or a recession. Banks borrow short and lend long. So the bank is borrowing in uh, overnight rates. Uh, short term and medium term interest rates, and then they're lending it out to us as investors or consumers at higher rates. So if they can get their money for 1% that they've got to pay back to the central bank or, or another bank, let's say they're going to charge us, you know, three to 4% perhaps. So they make two to 3% spread over the long duration. Okay. So let's take a look. Here's the US 10 year yield. So this is the yield chart. So every time you see the yield going up, which you can see it's on an absolute mission there on all three of these, the price action itself, the moving averages here, you've got the 20, 50, 100 and 200 day moving average. You've got lots of momentum uh, into overbought territory and we've got our signal price crossing over here on the MACD. So over the last year, uh, it's only gone one way and you think to yourself, the price of that is the inversion. So um, the price of these bonds has been dropping like a stone. So from where you were paying, uh, you know, or where the bond was paying 1.5%, it's now paying over 2.8%. That's a, that's a very, very big increase when you think about the ripple effects that that has in the economy.
Let's take a look at the 10 year over a longer time frame. So back in the, since the eighties, where you look at about 15%, I mean, that's, uh, it's scary to imagine right now. And so you, your mortgage was probably somewhere around 22 to 25%. I mean, that's very, very expensive. Solves house, housing and affordability, but obviously that's, uh, that would be a big, big shock to the uh, economy. Here we have had this steady decline over the last few decades. And interestingly, interest rates are inversely correlated with asset prices. So if you have this start to drop, the asset prices uh, start to rise. So we've had a, a bull market in bonds. We've had a bull market mainly in stocks, real estate and every other asset because interest rates have been so cheap and people can therefore afford to bid up the prices of all these other assets. Uh, so we're down about 80% from all time highs. I've heightened this little, uh, uh, let's call it a top of the hill here, a little speed bump, which was uh, December, 2018. I remember that very well. I just bought a business and then, um, the stock market crashed and I wanted to really get in, but I didn't have as much money as I would have liked. Anyway, that's timing. And so as you can see, then they eased off money, uh, in monetary conditions. And then we had COVID. So we had extremely loose monetary policy uh, and fiscal policy uh, to boot. And so here we're, we're testing uh, where we were just prior to that um, Christmas Eve sell off in 2018. So light crude oil. So oil is the a barrel of oil is a another metric uh, that things can be priced in because oil is is still the the driver of our economy, whether we like it or whether we don't. Here we've got the price action. Obviously, it's been on an absolute um, tear over the last year. We had um, bef at the end of the year we had the Keystone, we've had Keystone pipeline being cancelled and all this supply crunch starting to come to the fore. Then we had Russia, Ukraine situation and oil screamed higher. It's sold, it's since sold off. They re released the, some SPR, which will do nothing uh, for the long-term supply. Really um, it's a drop in the ocean. And so I expect that to start to come back. If for reference, if we take the last 10 years, and we look at the top here that I've marked out was around 2014 at 140 US dollars uh, WTI uh, or, or the futures of the oil, I should say. And then we had the shale implosion because all the uh, producers went out and borrowed a heap of finance off the high oil price to invest into more oil fields that brought more oil onto the market. And what do you know, if you flood, if you flood the market with supply, all of a sudden the stuff you're selling gets cheaper and then you've borrowed against that oil at a higher price and you have this daisy chain reaction all the way down. And here we are, we had COVID sell off. Here we are at the end of the first quarter of 2022 and we're still not back at all time highs. I think we'll, uh, it'll be at least $180 until we get into demand destruction. That means that um, you know, the prices for energy is too high, that manufacturing starts to slow down and we get a real recession simply because the input costs make it uh, unfeasible for growers, for example, agricultural growers or um, industrial manufacturers to continue their operations. And so you have this re retraction and then you have big sell-offs, the price starts to come down and then we, we go again. That could take a long, long time to resolve. Okay. We didn't get into this predicament overnight and we're not going to get out overnight, which is why I'm so bullish on energy. I think we could uh, you know, potentially get up into the, the 200s. I've bought um, some call options on oil futures, some even as high as uh, $200 strike prices. Okay, so uh, I'm, if they go into money, uh, it's obviously it's going to be painful for a lot of people, but uh, I'm going to be very happy with the payoff on the, the futures options. As you can see here, we've got bullish MACD signal and uh, crossing over the, the signal line, and we have uh, a huge, uh, almost heading into overbought territory on the RSI. Let's talk about the dollar itself, the instrument that we're quoting all the time when I say, oh, my house is worth, my car is worth, this stock costs, you know, we don't use those terms very well. It's what we're really saying is the dollar bid for Cenervas stock at $18.60, it's telling you as much about the dollar as it is about the asset. So the price of gold is telling you just as much about the price of the dollar that it is the gold. In fact, I would argue even more because gold is such a, an inert, uh, finite um, asset or, or material.
So the petrodollar system props up the dollar. Why? Because there's an agreement since 1972 that the Saudi Arabia, or the, the world, but particularly Saudi Arabia being the, the oil producer at the time, would only accept US dollars for their oil. And in exchange, the United States would provide uh, the Saudis with security. This creates a huge demand for dollars for all over the, the world because everywhere uh, in the world and everyone in the world uses oil. This is also a psychological comfort in holding what's perceived to be hard currency. So I talked to a lot of people in uh, Venezuela and Argentina, um, different people across Latin America, and they're absolutely hell bent on trying to get their hands on dollars. Why? Well, of course, if you own, uh, if you earn your income in bolivars or if you earn them in pesos, these things have had inflation of like seventy percent year on year. Argentina, I think, was forty two percent year on year. So it's just insane the amount of inflation that goes through these economies. And so there's this psychological uh, effect that you're trying to get into dollars to use it as a safe haven to store your wealth. Okay, that may or may not be. Um, accurate when all this is said and done when you think about the amount of you know, the dollars lost 99 or 98 percent of its value over the last um, 100 years but it, it's all relative so if you're comparing it to the, the venezuelan bolivar or the argentinian peso you, you you know that it's bad to hold dollars but you know that it's a lot worse to hold your local currency so when things get tough people uh, sell off uh, emerging market bonds and uh, money market instruments and they herd back into the US dollar at least temporarily and that of course puts further bids under the dollar and uh, and props it up a strong dollar eventually hurts US exports because if your exports rise in terms of they're being sold in dollars so the value or the bid of the dollar starts to rise underneath your goods you have this demand destruction because other people can't afford as much of your US uh, denominated exports as they used to. So that eventually turns out to be deflationary pressure for the US economy. I was listening to an interview with Jeffrey Gunlark last night, um, who I think nailed it. Uh, he said he expects stronger dollar, uh, rising yields. Uh, the Fed are going to rise until they break something. So the dollar is a trade. Um, shorting bonds is a trade up until the next recession, and then they'll ease off. They'll go back to the you know the old easy money policies. This will lower interest rates and then lower demand for the dollar, and so you'll start to see a, a, a decline in the the bid for the dollar. Okay, try not to use the word value of the dollar, but the bid for the dollar. Dollar index, okay, has been strong. We'll talk about that. The dollar versus oil and gold has been weak because these are real assets that are being used. And the dollar versus uh, a cross rate, such as dollar euro cross rate, etc. We're going to talk about that as well because these two are both floating abstractions. Let's see how one performs against the other. So the Dixie, this is a um, an index that gives a, a proxy for the strength of the US dollar. As you can see, this has absolutely gone on a mission over the last year from the depths of just dipping under 90, it's gone all the way up to over uh, triple digits here. MACD and RSI are both bullish in terms of the momentum. And that makes sense if the Fed is starting to raise interest rates um, dollar denominated debt is going to pay you higher as an investor and so with things starting to look a little bit hairy if people think that the economy is going to slow they're going to look for safety in terms of their their debt instruments such as bonds and they're going to look to uh, us denominated bonds so that puts further strength under the dollar here we have uh, another chart over a longer time frame okay so as we can see here we've gone through some huge dips and uh, we may get back up to around the 104 mark, which is the previous high, or just under 104 is the previous high. It remains to be seen. And then I think we'll start to slow. So if the, dollar, if the Dixie were to start to go uh, over 104, it might be starting to run out of steam. And maybe you want to look at uh, perhaps a short position, depending on what your, your style is. The euro over the US dollar. Okay, so as this chart falls, that means that the dollar is strengthening against the euro. So think about the number of US dollars needed to purchase uh, one euro. If that graph starts to drop, it means you need less units to purchase the euro because the US dollar has actually strengthened. 
Okay, so it's strengthened uh, nearly 14% uh, over the year. The euro is getting absolutely crushed. And if we take a, a, another look, we're seeing essentially the, the same thing. Thank you very much for watching and um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you are interested in a, a global macro value fund that does go long and short depending on the situation you might want to take a look at copying the portfolio if you don't uh, already follow me on twitter you can uh, follow me at the roi channel and of course if you like this content and you'd like to see more please like and subscribe and comment for any questions Disclaimer, guys, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know your personal situation. And so please don't mistake anything that you hear uh, me say as financial advice. It's not, it's just my opinion. And it's what I am doing with my money and the money that I manage. Okay, so please make sure you take responsibility for your own decisions and uh, do your own due diligence. Having said that, I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to catching up with you in another video shortly.